Good morning, my name is Roxana Myers and I'm a research plant pathologist specializing in nematology at the USDA's Daniel K. Inouye U.S. Pacific Basin Agricultural Research Center, also known as PBARC. This is a photo of our laboratory and office space located in Hilo. One of the missions of our organization is to develop sustainable practices to mitigate pests and diseases in tropical crops grown on our islands. Today I will be sharing information about the Kona coffee root knot nematode, its best management practices, how a nematode infestation can impact the severity of coffee leaf rust, and how these two devastating diseases can be managed concurrently. Nematodes are non-segmented roundworms that exist in virtually every environment on the Earth's surface. Many are free-living beneficial organisms that live in marine ecosystems while others are important decomposers in the soil. Nematodes can also be parasites of plants, insects, animals, and sometimes humans. Today we will focus on plant parasitic nematodes, which are economically important since they can cause severe damage to agricultural crops worldwide, resulting in losses in the billions of dollars. Plant parasitic nematodes are microscopic, live within the root or rhizosphere of host plants, and have a silent mouth part for piercing plant cells. This movie depicts a cluster of burrowing nematodes feeding on carrot discs in our laboratory culture. The bottom photo is an adult female of the Kona coffee root knot nematode, which establishes a feeding site within the root, becomes sedentary, and lays hundreds of eggs in a gelatinous matrix. Plant parasitic nematodes exist as a number of diverse species, but all cause extensive destruction to the root system of their hosts. So how do nematodes damage crops? First of all, by sheer number. Tens of thousands of these tiny animals can inhabit and feed on the root system of one tree. Through feeding and invasion, they destroy and weaken the root system. This interferes with the uptake of water and nutrients, resulting in stunting of the plant and increasingly poor crop yields. A heavy nematode infestation will weaken the tree's immune system, making it more susceptible to infection with coffee leaf rust and reducing the tree's ability to fend off the disease, resulting in an increase in severity of CLR symptoms. What are the symptoms of a nematode infestation on your coffee farm? The first thing you'll notice is flagging and yellowing of the leaves. Many growers assume this is caused by drought or fertilizer deficiency. It's a result of a reduction in water and nutrient uptake, but the initial cause is the destruction of the roots by the nematodes, which impedes their ability to function. Overbearing dieback commonly occurs from a long-term nematode infestation. Stump wobbliness and tree toppling will also occur over time. A simple way to diagnose a nematode infestation in the field is if you can easily uproot a large tree by hand. Once the tree is removed from the ground, a corky taproot with few feeder roots will be observed. Over time, the trees will continue to decline and mortality is common after 10 years. So what's the root knot nematode situation on Hawaii Island? Well, we have a nematode called Meloidogyne conaensis, which is more pathogenic on coffee than most root knot nematode species. It's widespread in the Kona coffee growing region and it's becoming established in Kau. It causes severe decline of trees, resulting in a steady decrease in harvested yields per acre over time. The best defense against plant disease is a healthy tree. Healthier plants have a stronger immune system. With optimal growing conditions, plants are better equipped to fight off parasites and diseases. If you optimize fertilization and soil health and control insect pests and disease, it's going to go a long way to helping your trees um, fight nematodes and coffee leaf rust. Eradication of nematodes in the field is not possible. Host plant resistance is the only effective management strategy. The planting of resistant cultivars or grafting susceptible cultivars on nematode tolerant or resistant rootstocks is a viable and effective solution. Host plant resistance is the most effective and practical way to control root knot nematodes in the field. Utilizing nematode tolerant or resistant rootstocks allows for the mitigation of nematode damage while still maintaining the high quality taste and when available, the disease resistance of the scion. Andrea is going to present more on the technique of grafting after this talk, but I would like to focus on a long-term research project that was conducted in collaboration with the University of Hawaii CTAR Extension that highlights the importance of this management technique. Why does grafting on nematode-tolerant rootstocks work? 
Here in Hawaii, Coffea liberica is commonly used. The species itself is a larger, faster growing tree, which also has a more robust, extensive root system, which remains vigorous even under heavy nematode infestation. When nematodes feed on typica, the roots die back and the root system goes into decline. When liberica roots are being attacked, new root growth is stimulated. A 13-year field study was conducted at the Kona Experiment Station in Kainalio that evaluated a nematode-infested field plot containing typica grafted onto seven different cultivars of varying nematode tolerance or susceptibility and compared with non-grafted trees. Tree yield, plant health, plant growth, and nematode populations were evaluated. Near the end of the study, the results were visually striking. Over time, non-grafted typica showed severe decline as shown in this photo and high mortality. Typica grafted on tolerant Liberica rootstocks or resistant robusta varieties like Namaya, shown here, remained healthy with high yields. These are the average yields of red cherry in pounds per tree per season. The four Liberica cultivars produced the highest overall with averages up to 10 pounds. Namaya was also statistically similar in production volume. The robusta cultivar Apuara and the Arabica cultivar purpurea had poor yields under three pounds per tree. Typica trees produced under one pound per tree due to the high mortality overall. This table shows the mortality of typica trees grafted onto various rootstocks. The Liberica cultivar Arnoldiana had no mortality during the 13-year study. The other Liberica cultivar and Namaya had only six to 12% tree death. 81% of the non-grafted typica trees died and were removed from the field as shown in this photo. Please visit the UHC TAR Free Pubs website for more information. There are numerous extension bulletins focusing on coffee cultivation available for download, including a pictorial guide to coffee grafting and the Kona Coffee Root Knot Nematode Sampling Procedures, which explains step-by-step -step how to properly collect soil samples for analysis by ADSC. The final section of my presentation will focus on an ongoing study to evaluate cultivars resistant to coffee leaf rust for nematode tolerance or resistance. As mentioned earlier, one of the most promising management options for disease control is the use of host plant resistance. This technique not only helps mitigate the damage caused by root knot nematodes, but also damage from coffee leaf rust when CLR resistant cultivars are employed. There are efforts underway to import CLR resistant cultivars into Hawaii using the proper channels which involve permitting through HDOA and APHIS and a one-year quarantine. PBARC was approved to import a collection obtained from World Coffee Research that is currently in tissue culture and being multiplied for disease screening and field evaluation. As a nematologist, my responsibility is to screen these cultivars so I am able to make a recommendation to graft them onto nematode-tolerant rootstocks before planting or plant directly in the field. Since it doesn't make sense to replant your field with CLR-resistant material, only to see mortality after 10 years from root nut nematodes. Because the WCR material is still in tissue culture, we started screening Obata and Tupi, which are known CLR-resistant cultivars already being cultivated in Hawaii. These were compared with the nematode-resistant Namaya and Ethiopian Arabica, as well as the nematode-susceptible Typica. This was conducted in potted plants in the greenhouse. Each plant was inoculated with 2,500 eggs of Kona coffee root knot nematode and allowed to reproduce for one year. Plant growth, root weight, root rot rating, root health rating, nematode populations, and nematode reproductive factors were all evaluated. The results of the study showed susceptible typica and tupi to have the highest nematode reproductive factors. As expected, Namaya and Ethiopian Arabica were resistant with very little reproduction and reproductive factors under one. The Obata cultivar had moderate nematode reproduction and was considered susceptible to Kona coffee root nut nematode. Root rot of the infested plants were evaluated with a scale of 0 to 5 with 5 being the highest level of damage. Obata had the greatest amount of root rot indicating a very low tolerance to nematode infestation and was statistically similar to Tupi and Typica, while Namaya and Ethiopian Arabica had fairly low root rot ratings. These photos show the infested roots after being removed from the pots and cleaned. 
As you can see, Namaya had a healthy, robust root system, even in the presence of nematodes, while Obata showed varying levels of damage, but an overall reduction in feeder roots and higher levels of rot were observed. In conclusion, Tupi and Obata were good hosts for the Kona coffee root knot nematode with high levels of nematode reproduction. They were both also considered highly susceptible to nematode infestation, suffering severe damage to the root systems. Our recommendation is when replanting to continue grafting these cultivars on nematode-tolerant rootstocks such as Liberica. As previously mentioned, this project will be ongoing with further greenhouse and field evaluation of CLR-resistant cultivars from World Coffee Research and other sources. I would like to say a big thank you to all of my collaborators and colleagues who assisted with this research, and thank you very much for your attention.